Does it have a name, a common this, name? Yeah, this is called the MS Media okay. from Mercy and Scooch. Um, scientists are really not creative with these things. <laughs> I would call it like super awesome, this is incredibly media, but that's just Okay, so the, there's four major plant hormone uh, families. Cytokinins and oxins, which we spoke of. And then there's two other ones, gibberellins and florigens. And the florigens are debated as to how they work or if it really triggers blossoming because light has more to do with fluorescence than hormones. 
And gyrolic acid is really cool as a sculpting tool because it actually elongates the stem. So if you ever have tissue cultures that are really stubborn and they just make leaves, but you need a stem, um, which I'll explain later why you need a stem, uh, this hormone is really awesome. You just add to it and it will stretch out the stem significantly. <coughs> so it does something super interesting, which I think you guys might, en might enjoy. Uh, so this, for chemists, this is how some of these families look like. One of the uh, hormones is actually a gas, ethylene. If you put bananas in the back, they ripen because they secrete ethylene. And that makes a positive feedback loop which induces ripening, which produces more ethylene, which induces ripening. And then it turns brown. Um, okay, so. Tell you ripen a pineapple at home, incidentally. Yeah. If you buy pineapples at the store around here, you know, they're a little unripe. Stick them in a paper bag with banana for about three or four days, you'll have a really ripe, sweet pineapple. See, awesome knowledge. <laughs> it's common knowledge. <laughs> Uh, but uh, yeah, so the chemical is ethylene. Ethylene was actually su suspected to be uh, what the oracle at Delphi was smelling in their pits. Uh, high amounts of ethylene can cause you to trip a little bit. Um, just a fun fact. Okay, so one of the interesting things about the hormone oxygen is what you might have seen. Uh, a lot of projects involve this in like rudimentary, like the middle school and high schools that actually show the phototropism. Uh, phototropism. <laughs> So basically, uh, oxins are light sensitive, and wherever there is no light, the hormones, wherever there is no light, the hormones increase. So where, uh, like we spoke of earlier, the oxins induce elongation. So wherever the light is opposite, it starts to stretch and it actually bends. The plant. Yeah, exactly. Um, so during a plant's life cycle, uh, specific hormones have different actions. And uh, so GA is gibberellic acid, ox is oxin, CK is cytokinins. Uh, ABA is abscisic acid, which is uh, basically the thing that causes fall to happen when the leaves come down and they're all turn like pretty colors. Uh, abscisic acid causes an abscess at the point where the stem meets the leaf, and it falls off. Abscisic acid also has many, many other functions. Uh, there's no, like these things aren't really compartmentalized, so when somebody says that an auxin induces root formation, it also induces elongation, it also induces, um, it skips a, set, a part of the cell cycle, there's a recent publication on that. But uh, yes, yeah, so those are some of the things. So the question some people ask is, what can you do with these hormones? And I say, somatic embryogenesis. <laughs> so this is a uh, really like <laughs> jargony word that basically means babies from the body. All right, really simple. So you can take a cutting, a little piece of leaf, and put it on a media containing two hormones in different ratios. So I use benzyl aminopurine and uh, naphthalene acetic acid, which are synthetic derivatives of naturally found plant hormones, auxins and cytokinins. So when cytokinins are up and auxins are up in the same ratio, it confuses the plant and it induces this weird tumor state. Now that tumor state is stem cells. Uh, at that point, it's a, it's a canvas that you can build any type of tissue out of. Um, so basically, for each step, every two weeks, you have to change the plant's diaper, so you have to move it to the next plate and the next plate. And uh, along the way, you change the ratio of those two hormones. And with just those two hormones, you can actually take a piece of, this is like hypocotyl, like the place where the root and the stem uh, meet in sequence. It's one of the most useful tissues. Uh, and induce this tumor state, and out of the tumor state you get these tiny little shoots. Now there's a problem here. Everyone who's seen a plant before has a shoot, a stem, and roots. There are no roots here. So you can grow a whole plant without roots, but now you have to actually build the roots. So now you move them onto another media that contains a rooting hormone, an auxin, which uh, actually grows the roots. So you're basically going uh, tumors, shoots, roots. You're constructing a plant, essentially. And that's the process of somatic embryogenesis. And by doing so, you can make millions and millions and millions of plants. Uh, like I did at home. I became like a farmer. It was ridiculous. I had full and spring bottles everywhere, full of organs. Um, but this is also really important for uh, commercially important crops, like let's say ornamentals. Um, a lot of specific phenotypes for ornamentals only happen um, without sexual crossing. So the second you cross two plants, they start mixing and matching their chromosomes, and it ends up not being the, the plant that you want. So if you ever buy a packet that says, like, true blue petunias or something, you're going to get whites and purples in there. So the best way to do it is to asexually clone it. That'll keep 100% the genetic identity of it, and you're literally just cloning. So if you have a really interesting plant, like, for example, the Rembrandt tulip, which is caused by a virus, which causes these, like, little... Uh, red pebbles that also have these white flames on it, you do somatic embryogenesis to clone it ad nauseum and then sell them and it'll be genetically identical. So when you do a plant variety patent, which is basically like a weird patent just for plants to, to like hold a specific phenotype, 
or a physical attribute, you want to do, you have the rights to clone it asexually. If you buy anything that's patented, you can clone it sexually, you just might not get what you want. But you don't have the rights to clone it asexually, that's where that patent comes in. So now, uh, like with everything in life, what happens if you make a mistake? So what if the hormones are wrong, what if the ratios are incorrect? What if you put too much oxen or too much of this, or in my case, too much gibberellic acid? Well, something really interesting happened. So this is a tomato that I've been trying to clone, and uh, this is some leaves, started making shoots. And if you see this right here, that's actually a tomato, in vitro, with no roots. Nice. So you can think of some uh, applications for things that involve flowers that are biopharmaceutically important that you can induce in a jar. Just so it's almost like hydroponic. Yeah, minus the hydro and the expensive and the infrastructure. You can just do this. So this was a total accident. I'm trying to reproduce it. And one thing I managed to do is this. It's kind of like the opposite of the food crisis. It's making it smaller. <laughs> but it was really fun. Um, it can't really get it to work that well anymore. It kind of makes these weird blobby type potatoes. So that's a micro, micro tomato and a super tiny potato. And here's the standard core. They're super small. So they're like food for dwarves like little fairies or things like that. Okay, so aside from making mistakes, what else can you do with uh, plant hormones? Well, you can do plant genetic engineering. <laughs> plant genetic engineering. Okay. So there's, um, okay, so here on the, on the left, on your side, this is, uh, I forget the name of the plant. I'm doing plants, I don't know what I'm anyway. um, So this is Bt toxin, with or without the transfer. So over here, these are uh, um, specific weevils that eat these plants, and the Bt toxin is being expressed in these leaves, and you can see night and day the difference. So uh, I'm trying to, trying to be as neutral as possible on this statement, because a lot of people are really just anti-GMO, it's not sexy to be pro-GMO, so I'm just going to avoid it as much as possible. Uh, secretly, I really like GMOs, they're super powerful. But, uh, and if anybody's ever seen the Kickstarter recently, with the glowing plant and the fiasco that it's called, uh, but basically you can do Genetic engineering using those hormones and a process that I'm going to explain. It's right? weird because Kickstarter has this thing that says that you're not allowed to do any GMOs. And it's because of them. Because yeah. uh, just a little quick rant. Um, well, let me explain this first and I'll rant. Okay, so uh, it all started with this bacteria. So have you guys ever seen a tumor? Not quite this size, but something like that. So this is called crown gall. It's a, it's a blight amongst uh, rose farmers or uh, rose gardeners because you get this little mass at the bottom and it's a disease. Now the bacteria that causes the disease is Agrobacterium tumefaciens, or agro for short. Now this is a fantastic uh, organism because it's been doing genetic engineering long before humans like, came down from the tree. Uh, it is nature's only genetic engineer, as far as I know, and it does this really interesting thing. So Agrobacterium is like a shark in the water, and the second it smells plant blood, it does this thing where it almost goes to a near suicide to change its behavior, to try to transfer a little segment of its DNA into the plant. And it actually hijacks plant machinery for it to get in, uh, impregnated into that plant. So wherever it's wounded, here's like a little wound. Uh, these things are phenolics, which are plant blood, essentially. So every time you smell fresh cut grass, there's just millions of organisms screaming and dying. But, uh, <laughs> so phenols, they, uh, they trigger this pathway that induces virulence and it's an incredibly expensive process and it almost no, never works unless it's perfectly conditioned. And a uh, region of its DNA gets transferred in. Now that region of its DNA codes for food and shelter that only bacteria can utilize. So it's basically rewriting the genetic makeup of the genome of the plant to produce shelter around the bacteria. And in doing so, it actually causes the bacteria to grow and it's basically like the one in a million shot chance of having the perfect retirement for this bacteria. Or else it'll just <laughs> die on the floor. So, what scientists have done was remove the oncogenes, the things that actually cause this tumor, and put in whatever gene they like. And I'm going to explain the process through some original images of what I do on like a daily basis. So you start with the bacteria, and it's on a plate, and you take one of these colonies, and you grow it up in a flask. Now that flask uh, contains a bacteria in a medium, like LB medium, which I hate and I can rant for hours about, but uh, you have to grow it to a specific concentration. And that concentration can be measured using a device I made that's like four bucks, and it uh, can remove a $2,000 spectrophotometer for this specific purpose. Uh, it's 3D printed, open source, it's awesome. So basically you go from, bacteria was inoculated, T0, and then every hour I check it manually, and it eventually gets a concentration that my computer outputs as 0.5. That basically means that on a growth curve, 
I'm sure people have seen these types of curves if you're working with bacteria. So this is, I'm actually doing some research on this to disprove certain parts, like that this doesn't really happen. Yeah, anyway, um, so somewhere here is where some graybeard long ago said that this is the best place for bacteria to be the most virile in the environment, or the most active. So it's actively dividing, it's not buried, it's not dying. And that's where you want to stop it. So mid-log phase. And mid-log phase is about 0.5 on a logarithmic scale from 0 to 2. So basically, you bring it up to 0 0.5, and you take some leaves, and you cut it up inside the liquid. This is really important, because it has to actually, the bacteria has to physically get in the grooves of the cut. Whenever you cut a plant, it induces uh, phenolic uh, exudates. So it bleeds, the bacteria smells the blood, it goes in nuts, and it starts doing the work that we, I showed you in the previous slide, where it transforms that tissue. But it doesn't transform the tissue in the center. It transforms the tissue at the edges, the places where I've cut. So only those cells are transformed. So after that, you take those cells, you dab them with cotton. Everything is aseptic, and I'll explain uh, during the demo how to be super sterile when this happens. So you plate them on a, on a um, MS plate with no antibiotics, and then you wait 24 to 48 hours. Now you're starting to see this halo. So this halo over here is actually the bacteria growing and uh, hopefully doing its job. So after 24 hours, this is a good sign that the bacteria actually uh, hopefully did its job. Now you've transferred those uh, leaves onto a media containing antibiotics that kill the bacteria. They want it to do its job, not take over the plate. Because what's in the plate is sugar and carbon source that life requires. So it's going to flood the plate and it reproduces faster than the plant, so it'll kill it when you're competing for food. So when you plate these things, you plate them not on regular media, but media containing hormones to do the regeneration, which we spoke of, as well as a, a herbicide, which is a natural selection marker. So when, um, when agrobacterium transforms, this is actually a leaf curl up. It only transforms the edges. All the other tissue is wild type, and it doesn't have the metabolic burden of expressing the gene that you gave it, so it's going to grow a lot faster. So you want to only grow the tissue that is transformed. So you put it on an herbicide that will normally kill it, and in the circle of DNA that you gave agrobacterium, it also confers uh, herbicide tolerance. So everything else dies except for your tissue. And after about two weeks' time, you should see these tiny little dots form. Those little dots are actually tumors of cells that were transformed. The only way for that to grow, the herbicide itself is a 16S inhibitor, so you can't produce protein, so it can't grow, that protein you don't have life. So everything else stays in stagnation. And uh, if you're doing this as a scientific presentation, you always have wild type on top that hasn't touched uh, agrobacteria at all. So if I see these things happening here, I screwed up somewhere. That's happened so many times. <laughs> um, so after another two weeks, the uh, tissue starts to differentiate even further to make these like pseudo leaves. You can see them a little clearer here. So now my job as the technician is to take uh, these 5,000, like, I wish I had a zoom out picture of this because I have like petri dishes everywhere. So every two weeks I have to transfer them. And these things actually double every two weeks. So two, four, eight, sixteen shooting. It's ridiculous. That's why I kind of give up on the cloning aspect and focused on genetic engineering. Um, so we cut it right here and we transfer it into a new medium. And that's me transferring it. And we continue to grow on the same hormones, nothing's changed, until actual shoots start forming from the tissue itself. So here's the undifferentiated stem cells. And out of here, through uh, many stochastic uh, interactions with the hormones that are in the media, the hormone itself diffuses throughout the entire tissue. Um, so randomly, and it, it almost is truly random, I kind of want to do an investigation on that, but basically, uh, whatever cell is the most viable actually starts to produce a shoot in your body. So this is basically everything that a plant is minus the roots. So with the scalpel, you just cut that part off, and you put it in media containing rooting hormone. So the rooting hormone is higher than the shooting hormone. And eventually you get roots, and then those roots begin to get larger, and at this point, you can hold it in your hand. And uh, this is one of my favorite, this is the first one I've ever done, the first successful transformation. And you can see roots, leaves, a stem, it looks okay. It still has the algorithm. So what we do is you put it in water, you float it in tepid water, it's like water that you'd wash a baby with, not hot, not cold, just right and uh, carefully remove all the agar off the roots itself, because there's sugar inside, and once we put it in the soil, uh, the sugar is going to feed fungi, which can lead to botrytis, which is a terrible plant disease that kills the roots, and many, many other diseases. And if you do this right, you eventually get a forest that uh, somebody like myself has to analyze for the transgene, which takes forever. 
So every single one of these little stalks is an individual tobacco plant that's hopefully transgenic. So what I would do now is take a piece of leaf from each one, uh, isolate the DNA, and then run PCR on the gene that I inserted. And if everything works well, I get a gel like this. On the left side, you have the lab. On the right side over here, you have the control. Sorry, I didn't annotate. And all of these are the samples. So anything that looks like a control should be uh, positive for your transgene. So agrobacterium has an 80 to 90% efficiency. It's one of the best ways to transform plants. If you do it right, it's 100% efficiency. Um, just be very careful when you isolate DNA so you don't cross it, because then you get a false positive and you say, yeah, yeah, I did it when it really didn't happen. How long does this whole process take? Uh, it depends on the plant. So I work with tobacco because it's a physical, it's a real plant. Normally people work with Arabidopsis, which is this flimsy little thing that I hate terribly. Um, <laughs> it's not good for hyperspaces where you can't control uh, humidity and temperature. It's one of the most finicky plants on the planet. Um, but it's, they wrote a Bible like this big on every gene of the Arabidopsis genome, fully annotated. It's the model organism for plant uh, studies. Tobacco is like runner-up. But it produces flowers, it's a large plant, it's hardy. And um, I like having them in my house, I like so many of these things. And they do actually a really good job at filtering here. They have really high photosynthetic output, so the oxygen going out, and then you just swab the leaves with a wet paper towel, and that gets rid of some of the dust. You need a lot of plants to filter your house. Don't believe people saying, like, a little office plant, it's doing great. So anyway, what else can you do with uh, plants and hormones and things? One of the things I've been working on recently is novel hybrids through protoplast fusion. Uh, I think this is a fake picture, but this is a tomato. Essentially, there's tomato on top, potato on the bottom. You can do a graph like this, because uh, tomatoes and potatoes are part of the nightshade family. Anything that's close in a family, you can graph. Now, what if you want to graph something crazy, like an eggplant in a pine tree, or some, some, something wild? Like what, this is where like artists come in. Which is super. Uh, which I have the great fortune of working at the School of Visual Arts in the Bio Art Lab. And uh, Suzanne Anker, the chair of the art department, she basically babied this uh, small space into a very functional Bio Art Lab, where I get to help students do crazy stuff like this. And one of the projects we're working on is a novel hybrid that no one's ever seen before. So we're going to use a, uh, a protocol. Uh, I mean, a, a technology, I guess, which I'm going to explain right now to actually do that. So what is a protoplast? So these are naked plant cells. So plant cells are actually very simple hydraulic devices. Um, they don't have a skeleton, so they have to rely on hydraulic pressure in order to actually stay upright. So normally these cells, which is the plasma membrane with the cytosol inside, is surrounded by a cell wall. And that cell wall pushes while these guys push out. So they've evolved to actually take up more water than they can to create a hydraulic pressure, like stationary hydraulic modules that eventually lift it up. So that's why whenever a plant is lacking water, it wilts, because the hydraulic pressure drops. So using enzymes called, um, called cellulases, which digest cellulose, which is the main component of cell walls, uh, you can free these guys. The only problem is the second you free them, they'll still want to take up water and they'll pop. So now you have to introduce a thing called an osmoticum, which is essentially um, solute pressure. So the more you have dissolved in the liquid, the more dense the liquid is, the more pressure you have on the, on the liquids inside. I mean, on the, on the things inside. So with like 82 grams per liter of mannitol, which is a huge amount, you actually get a, chem, um, a concentration of solubility, sorry, a molality, that's high enough to actually push on the cells themselves to keep them spherical. Now, once they're spherical, you can do some really fun things. I'll explain right at the end. So the way you isolate a protoplast, it's really simple. So you take a meat cleaver and some spinach. This is really not an elegant solution, but uh, what you really do is you take these uh, pieces of leaves and you cut them up into very small strips. And those strips float in the liquid of um, mannitol, a bunch of other uh, hormones. Um, uh, hormones, sugars, vitamins, basically MS media plus hormones plus the enzymes. And it floats in there for about four hours. And after that, it starts to become this like algal soup. Now that algal soup is filtered. Um, sorry for the blur. It's filtered through a, uh, I think that's a 100 micron mesh. Uh, protoplast on average, if you do it right, are 50 micron. So you can fit two for every one mesh. And uh, you do this centrifugation process where the bottom part is 10% sucrose, and the top part mixed in with your, uh, with your cells, and the top part is 13% sucrose. And if you've ever had one of those fancy drinks at a bar where they layer the alcohol, it's a density gradient, essentially. So uh, uh, I think blood uh, analysis uses FICOL to do density gradients of different blood cells. But essentially, if you carefully layer these two and you spin it, what you're going to get right here at the middle is uncopped intact protoplasts. 
that are happy that you can actually utilize. Now, uh, I've used like seven different centrifuges across a bunch of hacker spaces, and I found that this one old hand crank centrifuge is the best. Because you can't get a swing out with really low RPM if you, uh, if you purchase like a swing out centrifuge. They only go out, they start at like 300 RPM. So what I did is I bought a hand crank centrifuge. I um, installed a, what is this, a metronome app on my iPhone. And I basically put it to my face, I calculated the RPM that I needed, and on the upstroke I would listen to the beat and it would click. Like, like, like an idiot for like five minutes. <laughs> what you get at the end, after all that hard work, is a literal textbook example of flat purification. So I'm super proud of this because it was so hard to do. I did this like a billion times. I wish that was hyperbole. And uh, <laughs> so what you have right here, like I was so happy that it even lined up perfectly. So here are the intact protoplasts. Here's a bunch of low density garbage, like vacuoles and broken cell stuff. And here's all the cell graveyard debris and stuff because you're too rough with them in the handle. So they kind of pop a bit, they're a little bit fragile. But what you get at the end, if you put under a microscope, standard microscope, is this image. And uh, the, this image actually came by accident because in the process of isolating the cells from the tissue, you have to mix it, I mean like orbitally shake it. And I shook it a little bit too fast and all the cytosol actually went onto the sides so and just like uh, and stuck on one side. But what's really cool is that right here, that's the plasma membrane. So you can visibly see the plasma membrane. It's like an interesting proof that it's there. Yeah. Like you know that it's there, everyone knows that it's there, people do patch plant experiments and stuff, but here's a really nice image that you can do at home by just spinning them too fast. You can literally see it, which I think is fun. So now that these cells are isolated, you can treat them with polyethylene glycol and induce them to fuse. So what's happening here is that polyethylene glycol, you know, Miralax, for anybody who wants to buy it and not pay for the chemicals, uh, PEG3350 is Miralax, and you know, food grade Miralax is just as pure as reagent grade to an extent. It's good enough for plants. Um, so when you put it in there, it's narrow below with Miralax. Peg acts as an aggregator and moves things together. And at the right concentration, you can actually induce them to fuse. Now let's say this is a tomato cell and this is a potato cell, and they fuse together. What will the resulting hybrid be? So if the cytosol mixes and the nucleus mixes, um, what could become that? Would it be a tomato? These possibilities actually um, are at the forefront of crop engineering. So we want to make new, hy new hybrids that are useful to uh, consumption, like better corn, better rice. Uh, we uh, tolerance without genetic engineering by just breeding. Like you can breed two types of rice, one that's drought tolerant, one that produces more starch. And you fuse them together instead of like cross-pollinating and waiting and praying. You can, uh, using the same in vitro technology of needles to hold things together, you can actually just bring them close and physically fuse them because they act like soap bubbles. So with enough pressure, you just go and they fuse. Uh, what begins with it is a whole different uh, can of worms because let's say plant A has a very distinct medium requirement and plant B has a very distinct yet different medium requirement. When you fuse them together, is it the sum of its parts? Is it something new? Will I lose my plant in vitro because I don't know what the hell it means? Those are some questions that keep me up at um, so, so the next part to keep this relevant to bioprinting, what I call the next frontier, uh, a plug for you guys, biobots, is the biobot. So this is plant bioprinting, or at least uh, my boss's idea of what she wants. So uh, two, two and a half years ago, something like that, she came up with an idea. She's like, I want to print a plant. Can we do that? I'm just like, I don't know. Let's try. So we were thinking, we were thinking, then the uh, bioprinting revolution started, and then you guys came along. And um, Suzanne, my boss, like generously purchased one of these for the lab for students to utilize. So this is normally made for mammalian cells, right? And uh, we're going to try to change this thing to actually induce uh, plants to be printed, like the cells to be printed. So you can use an alginate calcium chloride or a calcium sulfate solution to uh, print out the structure embedded with cells inside. And what begets of it could be like this tumor log where plants come out of. Uh, from an artistic standpoint, you can curate a physical plant to be however you like, and then plants would come out of it. From a scientific side, uh, nobody knows what a plant ACM is. Nobody knows how plant tissues form. Because plants, the first thing they do when they separate it is to make new plants. They don't want to come back together. So all the experiments that people have done, utilizing, here's just an example of the test that you guys did that day, um, using PEG. Uh, but what plants want to do is turn into new plants. So here's an example of protoplasts. Embedded in alginate, two-dimensional alginate, on a grid, because like I said earlier, plants need to change their diapers every two weeks, and you can't pick up a single cell. So what you can do is embed it in a grid, and then pick up the grid and move it to a new dish. So after two weeks, 
you get these little pumps. And these little pumps are actually colonies of protoplasts. These are all mini plants, billions of, like millions of these uh, mini plants which you can separate and grow into a new plant. Now, a lot of the research done on plant uh, tissue formation or tissue fusing because they have this thing called the plasma desmata, which is gap junction, so every cell is connected. It's just one giant cell, essentially. Uh, we want to figure out how these plants induce tissue formation. So with 3D printing, you can actually layer the cells and see their effects, also with hormone concentrations. Because as hormones diffuse through a thick gradient, you'll have different reactions, which is exactly what plants utilize to form organogenesis, which is uh, producing flowers, producing leaves, and things like that. So with bioprinting, this could be a new uh, area of basic research for plants. Are you, um, are you, um, we only clone those uh, plants that have, um, you know, created from the uh, institution? Can you only clone them? Can you, can you, yeah, three, 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 yeah. Right, so, um, one of the main questions, I guess now would be a good time for questions, because, uh, there's my contact info, you guys can harass me at any time. That's my cell number, my actual cell phone number you can call. Uh, <laughs> send me text, whatever. Um, just a quick shout out to the DIY Bio Community and to School of Visual Arts for giving me the opportunity to do some really fun stuff. And the DIY Bio Community, which is, if anybody doesn't know of it, it's like the best place for citizen science. Um, I post there as often as I can. People from all over the world come together and come up with ideas of how you can be involved in the citizen science movement, trying to do meaningful, small, meaningful science. Um, Okay, so back to your questions. Um, chromosomal count. So when you think two cells and they divide, if you have like uh, three and five, it's okay. If you have anything that's odd, you might get disjunctions, which can lead to infertility. So you're actually tied to the ploidy of the plants that you're fusing, at least in theory. Because no one's really pushed this further because there's not a lot of um, industry backing to do this. Because novel hybrids are fine, but how will they match up to uh, vetted, strong elites, like elite corn, elite cotton, things like that, that will be really good for this. Um, so if you've ever seen a uh, strawberry that has like, a, it looks like a rooster's head, every single tip is one ploidy of it. So basically every single tip is one cell fused. So if you have eight little tips, you have eight strawberry cells fused together. Now plants naturally induce uh, polyploidy as a way of being vigorous. Because you basically get, uh, if you have two, you get two of everything. You get a thicker stem, it's a double foot thickness, you get more leaves, you get more flowers, and ideally you get more fruit. And I recently saw on, on fruit stands, Cherries that have two cherries for every one. You've now doubled crop yield using this technology. So it's like two for the price of one. This is like an incredible like leap forward in production. Uh, do you want to see cherries that have two two birds looking things on it? Like two weird cherry butt things? I don't know if people are interested in that. But um, they taste great. The first time I got it, it was a little weird because some of them were malformed. So like a bunch of ones that are like perfect and then a couple that are malformed. Um, so it's still a very nascent field in terms of fusion, but Hopefully, yes, it will be for uh, it will be for that's the holy grail. If not, you can do it through tissue culture, and it's essentially a trivial task once you get the protocol down. Sorry if I went to time. Mm -hmm. So, like, could you take up the plant? Say, say a plant is eaten by certain bug, and you're talking about putting plants together. You could put a plant that like, kills that type of bug and make its own pesticide. Yeah, yeah. Like so, you can do either do precision engineering, where you take one gene and you put it in, um, or you can do um, traditional farming, which would be like take pollen from the things, but you're limited in species. And this way, you kind of get the best of both worlds. So you get to fuse any plant with any plant, at least in theory. Because um, traditional farming can actually unlock dangerous uh, pathways. For example, potatoes are poisonous when they're green. It's an evolutionary adaptation. Uh, when predators scratch it up and the potato is exposed to light, uh, the potato turns green and it produces the alkaloids, which are very poisonous. Um, tomatoes are part of the nightshade family, and every nightshade is a very close cousin. Those pathways are, are dormant, but they're still possible. So when you do traditional breeding, you're taking two plants and kind of shotgunning them together by mixing pollen, and whatever comes out of it, you have no control over. So in a sense, we were fortunate enough to breed plants that are not poisonous to us because we kind of got rid of those uh, through selection, through that kind of selection. But a type of precision, or at least a more controlled way of taking traits from different places and mixing them together and seeing what happens might be an alternative to what uh, media has stigmatized as direct gene uh, targeted, uh, sorry, gene transformation. So as long as you have hormones, with no hormones they die. With one specific hormone, uh, with just oxygen, it starts producing cow's tissue and it starts dividing. Now, uh, Fiscomitrella patens, which is a moss, 
actually has protoplasts that don't induce uh, cell wall formation. So you can keep them in the culture and grow them on the outside. Yeah, and if you can find the actual chemicals, the hormones that uh, induce, I mean, repress cell wall formation, you can have a perpetual broth of whatever uh, plant you'd like to do testing. Because, I mean, if this takes four, uh, four hours, and then you have uh, genetic transformations, like transient acids, which take eight hours, in one full day, you can actually have um, a transformed plant. Right? So 24-hour turnaround time in a eukaryotic organism. You know, like, that's pretty huge. Um, outside of, like, yeast and bioreactors and things like that. Any other questions? Can you elaborate more on the scale of data? I'm sorry? Can you elaborate more on the scale of data? Okay, so because this is still in basic research, um, no one really is pushing this beyond like just the immediate like an epinote tube or like a petri dish in that sense. Uh, whether it's scalable is a bit like, I don't know if the, uh, generally I don't know, but most people don't because there's no, uh, there's no way to really predict the synergistic properties of having a ton of hormone pumped into it because it's hormones over time, but a little goes a long way. So there's diffusion aspects, there's spatial temporal aspects that might be difficult in a giant ferment. But for really short assays that want to test plant things, protoplasts are the way to go. It's a bit of an art to get it to like uh, the isolation process to be down, but once you do it, it's, uh, it's one of the most important tools. So in terms of, um, it seems like the way that the cells differentiate between the male and these plants are pretty different, like you don't, uh, like, if you're trying to grow like a little bone, like a baby just doesn't shoot up of it. Right, right. Um, <laughs> uh, is there is there a way with um, with plants so you can really just culture one particular type of cell? Yeah. So um, somatic organogenesis, which is the uh, the next step. So instead of just inducing babies, you can figure out the right hormone concentrations over time in like dosing. Like for example, microfluidics would be a great platform for this because you can just pump in a gradient generator. Um, with mm -hmm. a gradient of the hormones and pump them into single cells trapped in little cups. So you can see this like massive high throughput assay of differentiation. Um, in theory, yes, you can turn roots into petals. Um, do, are we there yet? I don't think so. But it's definitely can, it definitely can be done because um, we can turn any, uh, any cell into any other cell. It's been proven. It's just having the controllability of four is a different uh, topic. Mm -hmm. This is a main use with the transposons like the piggyback. Um, Chapter virus that utilize uh, the, the genetic transfer between those yes. various components. So there are viruses that can affect uh, plants, right? That can that, there's not much that can actually transfer their DNA directly in a good way. It's not like adenovirus or CMV in that sense. Um, I mean, CRISPR is a fantastic way to use it, but in terms of utilizing viruses that well, like I'm not that well versed in virology. And, in and of itself. But out of the technical side of things, which interests me most, I haven't seen viruses utilized in transformation. I've seen them used in silencing very many things. Yeah, you think for gyrophosphates, um, as the genetic, uh, you know, it, it has, uh, oh, it's like directed evolution. They're also using that same component to do the genetic transfer of uh, the components as transcodon, right, between various right. species. Right, oh, okay. And so That's can you do that between plant and mammalian? Plant and mammalian? Yes. Yeah. Well, cro crossing the species border, I mean, the kingdom border is interesting. Like, um, like for example, agrobacterium can transform mammalian cells. It can transform yeast cells. It can transform almost any cell. Um, so there is a link to it, utilize, like cross-kingdom transformations in that sense. Uh, but I don't know off the top of my head. One of the questions I had in this is, not only that use in being able to create these new structures and new life forms, you know, right. um, but we see the possible feedback environmentally of like colony collapse disorder, where like bees are getting viruses that only affect worms. Right, right, right. But army tapeworm is the vacuum virus. Mm -hmm. And it's on lettuce, like everywhere. If you pick up like, a head of lettuce right. in a grocery store, you will, like before it's washed off, see vacuum virus all over. Yeah, if that's like if, if that's the case that you can prove a one-to-one -one link, like, proving things are really difficult with these things because it's just uh, coincidence. There's a difference in causality and coincidence. Sure, sure. So if yeah, if that can yeah, if uh, if that can be done and you can harness it, that would like that would change things drastically because then you're no longer limited to uh, a vector-specific uh, modality where you have to use this specific vector to transform this kingdom uh, organism. Or like you don't need CMV virus to transform just plants. You can, I mean, transfer mammals. You can use one virus to transform them all and kind of hot swap. Um, I don't know much of it, but I mean, it makes sense because it, it's it's seen. If they, if you can really make a link between the two uh, and you can prove it one way or another, then that's wow.
for lack of better words. Well. Oh, sorry. Oh, um, how much of this stuff is currently patent encumbered so that any tooling around with it with a long view toward make, making it a business becomes a problem? Well, here's the cool part. A lot of this stuff, uh, patents expired like last year. Two years ago. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, so for, for these type of transfer, like agrobacterium transformations in general, the patents expired. Uh, the, there are specific uh, vectors for transforming with this bacteria that are completely in the public domain right now. They've, like, now's the time to get invested in plants and start doing these type of things. Um, not only for crop improvement, but also for basic research. I mean, basic research in plants, if you're not doing ecology, or you're not doing like uh, drought, salt, cold, or... Um, biofuel. Yeah, or biofuel, exactly. Then what are you doing? You know, like there's no money in it. Uh, but I think there's a lot of room in basic research. Because for example, there's a hormone in uh, plants, uh, uh, a zeatin-like hormone, it's a cytokinin, that's uh, analogous to a melanoma hormone. So it induces cell proliferation in the same sense. So you can use cancer, uh, cancer models with plants, but there are no models with plants yet, because there's no research being done, because they can't see the correlations. Or just, they don't just see the money, be, uh, like any type of industry behind that. Because anything that's cheap, you can't really regulate. Because I mean, you can do this with, uh, like, like the entire MS formula is essentially just the B6 vitamin, sugar, and like, salt if you really want to get that super cheap. Um, so the, the whole point of this is that anybody can do this, and like when startups can start working with plants. But for some reason, there's this like open secret that like we spoke about earlier, um, an, like an open trade secret with uh, tissue culture. Like nobody wants to talk about how to do it. It's like they're, they're like protecting themselves. Because um, tissue culture is a very rudimentary process, and a lot of people uh, suffer with contamination issues. Uh, my contamination rate, not to brag, is like one in 500, one in 600 jars. Um, and a lot of the times that happens with endogenous uh, fungi that you just can't control because it pops out at a later point and all of a sudden your plate is contaminated. So anybody starting with tissue culture um, always faces contamination and that leads to a lot of like grief and then you just don't want to do it anymore. <coughs> but uh, antibiotics are fantastic and you can just pump it in there and it works. Um, but yeah, so this is super accessible and I just I really don't know why more people aren't using plants. <laughs> so, so, so do, you, do you think that like you have like bio and plants to do some something that bothers me is the way that a food supply is really kind of locked up in a lot of big multinational corporations starting and that be liberated with uh, you know, research uh, with small startups, small you know, so yeah. I mean like if you make a novel hybrid and you put it in market as public domain, it's public domain. You know, so if you can, if you make a plant variety and actually patent it by putting it in the public domain, you're now adding crops to the public domain that people can utilize and do research on without being encumbered by patents. And I believe there are some companies that are trying to do this from a more traditional standpoint of taking heirloom varieties and doing plant variety protection, like plant variety patents, but in a way where it's like creative commons. So you now have an open source plant. That's what a lot of people are going towards, like open source tomato, open source potato. Because almost all the uh, all the crops that you see are commercially linked to something. You can utilize any crop for research; it's fine. Uh, but it can get really nasty if you're using an elite cultivar or something. But yeah, there's plenty of room for uh, for small things. All of, like especially because this is so accessible in the sense of like you just need a Tupperware container and a HEPA filter with some ducting, and you have a laminar flow hood. It's super simple. So like. Because of that, you can most likely have like people in the DIY bio community if they have, make a concerted effort towards this and make some kind of like, research consortium to do this. Yeah, they can definitely contribute. Um, whether or not people would want to because of the, their, their strange aversion towards plants because it's quote unquote difficult. Uh, I mean, I'm I'm self-taught in plant tissue culture, and like I, I know how to do it. I mean, I, I suffered, but like if you have people who know what they're doing and actually explain to people. To others, how to do it correctly and not make their mistakes, you actually can expedite the process. So this is like a really, really fertile ground for new open source movements towards like plant tissue culture for everyone. So. Yes? Um, there's a place up uh, in Glenwood called Scotland where they do the, the little fairy festival, like May Day festival that's coming up um, in Pennsylvania on the water. And some of the uh, local uh, horticulturists, druids, agriculture people, they're, they're using the building materials where they're growing their trees and whatnot in structures as homes, right. right. and then they would then, you know, as the trees grow, they create the lattice structure. I see bioprinting 
and some of these things that some of these artists are doing as a wonderful way to create these renewable like resource materials that not only could insulate you but feed you yeah. and like, offer all of these wonderful yeah, possibilities. If the, um, the major roadblock, the, the one roadblock that people can't uh, figure out a way around is actually the tissue formation. If you could figure out a scaffolding for plants, you made it. Like that's all you would need because now you can make, like you said, you can make a, a, a house that can build itself. You can make all these types of new, novel, architecturally, environmentally friendly, in a sense. Like you take oak cells and make an oak, essentially. You know, I mean, granted, a lot of the wood is dead cells, but you can also induce that. You know, so like the the, the, the wood grows, um, the scaffold grows, and then it dies and it forms. I mean, the, the plant grows, it dies and it forms wood, and then the cambium on the outside continues to grow. So there's a living area and a solid area. So essentially, it's like uh, a girder wrapped in living tissue that's constantly getting thicker and stronger with time. Yeah, so there's plenty of potential. It's just this one research uh, roadblock, it's just, oh, it's, it's so frustrating. Because you can see mammalian cells having these awesome scaffolds, and uh, you can grow them in all kinds of tissues, and then I look at plants, and I'm just like, why can't this work? This is silly. It's because they're so, so stubborn, they want to be all stars, and they want to just grow their own. Yeah, like a trellis. <laughs> yeah, like a little cellular trellis. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's online, and they find it would be great to do a little block on a tree of life. In for DNA. Right, right, right. Yeah. yeah, I mean, like, once again, like, I don't know if, if, uh, I mean, I'm almost certain that I'm not going to figure it out by myself for sure. Uh, but if anybody is interested in doing plant, uh, plant research in this thing, like, I'll share notes. This is entirely open source, and I really want to see this happen. You know, whether or not I can make a buck off of it, it doesn't matter. This is really cool things, you know. Like, um, and more importantly, if you can do this, imagine third world countries. Third world is a terrible word, but developing countries. And you can actually have these, these structures where not only it builds, uh, you don't just build a house, you build a city, you build a village, you know, you put it all in this whole thing, and you just let it grow, and in five years time you have, you have dwelling space, you know. One last question, sorry. Um, is there anything that might possibly be learned from parasitic or symbiotic plants in that kind of relationship? Yeah, so if, um, like there's, I forget the name, but there's one that, that crawls on uh, garden plants, and it, it blends in with the stem and it takes its nutrients, but it doesn't necessarily reinforce it in that sense. So like, it's not going to produce a scaffold as much as it's going to produce an acellular mess of just blobs, because the structure actually begins from the first initial cell and the initial uh, like contact point with the hormone itself. And it goes out in like a fractal afterwards, which is super interesting. Like, if you actually see plant physiology, you can see the different shapes, the torpedo, the hearts, which are all the different steps. And it's all differentiated because of hormones. Um, but a lot of the times, uh, parasitic things actually produce these acellular blobs. Wrapping? Wrapping? Do I have like two seconds? Yeah. Sorry. Okay, um, so there's something really interesting with grafting. So uh, you graft something together and the oxid pathway rebuilds the vasculature, right? So let's say if you bend the plant like this, and you break it but not completely, or it's right, the uh, hormone pathway is going to actually go in a direction away from light and fix its vasculature. Right? So at the point of the graft, uh, Ralph Brock, one of my all-time heroes, he works at the Max Planck uh, Institute for Plant Research. Um, and he basically grafted a tomato uh, and then cut the graft and sliced it. So basically the top part is a tomato resistant to herbicide A, the bottom is resistant to herbicide B. And you fuse them together and you cut the graft and you plate it on both herbicides. The middle part of the graft actually begets a new plant, which is a hybrid of the two. So there's actually a physical hybridization happening, which can lead to that type of scaffolding effect. So somehow cells that are separate yet still in tissue form are fusing. So that might be a good leak in that sense. Uh, but those cells aren't are divided. That's a they're static. So like again, this is just there's so little research done on this thing, as, at least as far as I know. Um, but yeah, that's a very good thing. Thank you so much, Sebastian.